Now, okay, okay, enough Facebook talk. Okay, we're going to do. We're gonna do uh, oh. <laughs> in, a, in a modern, in a modern cooling system, the coolant level is checked where? The radiator. Well. I the Yes, in well. I tell you what, the, the, if you go by the if you go by the textbook author, you're supposed to check it at the coolant recovery reservoir. But it's not always true. if you see that coolant recovery reservoir is up between the add and the full, and everything is fine, or is it fine? Open radiator. It depends on do you have a radiator cap. If you don't have a radiator cap, like on our GMC, they don't have a radiator cap. See what I'm saying? I mean, if you don't have a radiator cap on it, you know, yeah, yours doesn't have a radiator cap, and so you just got a surge tank. Now, what's the difference? What's the difference here? The cap that goes on this surge tank is going to be a pressure cap, and the surge tank is going to be a. I mean, I'm talking about the the pressure bottle. It's going to have a heavy duty plastic construction to it. It's going to be a lot more strong than just that little reservoir that you know where the. Uh, but if you look in the cooler recovery reservoir, you need to check that, but you also need to be looking at the radiator and um, and so on and so forth. So while discussing coolant changes, um, actually, if you want to get that question right according to the textbook writer, you're going to put B for coolant recovery reservoir. While discussing coolant changes, technician A says the old coolant can simply be poured down the drain. Okay. Technician B says... It, Used coolant must be recycled. Must be recycled. Well, yeah, what that means is you don't just pour it out somewhere. You're supposed to put it in. Well, we, we've got this tank out here in the back of the shop that we pour it in. You know, and they pump it out and they carry it. And I don't know what Safety Clean does with it, but they carry it away from here. But do not pour. That's like squirting, almost as bad as squirting refrigerant out of the atmosphere. And did you know when I was at the Ford place over there? Uh, and I'm talking years and years ago in the 90s, they brought us a piece of paper around. They handed it every mechanic, and they said, this piece of paper certifies that you will not pour antifreeze out on the ground. And they had a big tank back there that the antifreeze, they had barrels, actually. They had a funnel on the barrel, as you put on a barrel, and you got, you got waste antifreeze, you poured it in those barrels, and it was pumped out periodically. So for... Everybody that's listening to these words, you don't pour antifreeze on the ground, okay? Bad, because it gets in the groundwater, and we got enough trouble with our groundwater as it is. Uh, two technicians are discussing coolant flow. All right, two technicians are discussing coolant flow. Technician A says you should not be able to feel a coolant flow through the upper radiator hose while the engine is cold. Now, listen to what these people are saying. You should not be able to feel coolant flow through the upper radiator hose when the engine is cold. That's what technician A says. Technician B says when the thermostat opens, the upper hose should start getting hot, and you should feel a flow through it. I have never been able to feel flow through any of them. Yeah. Well, actually, you're going to feel the uh, in the thermostat. If the thermostat is between the upper radiator hose and the radiator, I mean, you know what I'm saying? I'm sorry, between the uh, upper radiator hose and the engine block then you're going to feel the upper radiator hose getting really hot when the thermostat's open. Yeah, it's supposed to. But it'll, be, it'll start to get hot down there close to the thermostat, and then when it's hot its whole length, and then the radiator's hot, you're going to know. However, uh, does any of you guys know which, I mean, where the thermostat is on like a 2.7 liter Chrysler Sebring? Where's the thermostat? Yeah. Or on a 2.8 liter and like an old Bronco 2 or something. Or on an Oldsmobile Alero with a quad. It's not in the upper radiator hose. It? It's not always in the upper radiator hose. On that Alero, it's under the back of the engine up there, way up. I mean, like you got to. It's nasty. I mean, you got to go behind the motor, behind the oil pan up under there. It's where it is. On the Sebring, it's behind the air conditioner compressor huh. on the engine block. Down on the side of the air conditioner compressor. You pull the air conditioner compressor, there it is. All right, uh, on the old 2.8 liter uh, Ford engines, the V6, you know, that preceded the 2.9 and the 4 liter and all that, uh, on those engines, it was in the lower radiator hose. 
So the long and the short of it is don't assume, don't ever assume that it's in the uh, upper radiator hose on every car because it's just not. But anyway, on a normal, you sh he should say on a contemporary cooling system, which is what we had for so many years, uh, or even now, if the, like a, you know the V8s that you're used to, like the 302 and the 350 and the old Chrysler 318, 360, and so many of them. Uh, the long and the short of it is, you better find the dadgum thermostat. You get it, Volkswagen Rabbit, the old Rabbit engine, the slant four that was in them Rabbits. The radiator, uh, the thermostat was in the bottom radiator hose, and those radiators didn't have a radiator drain on them either. They just expected you to pull that radiator hose off and pop the thermostat out of there, drain and cool it. And it was messy. All right. Technician A says the coolant. Well, now, number three, if you want to get it right according to the answer key, once again, it's going to be a Charlie. That's going to be a C. When we're grading your final exams, and it's me and you in the office, whenever you're giving me those letters, Chelsea, you hadn't done this before, you're going to say Alpha, Beta, Charlie, or Delta. You're not going to say A, B, C, or D. Or I may mark one all, but ain't wrong. Hey. Incidentally, Chelsea got 100 on her uh, speech debunking uh, climate change. So that was pretty good. I was really proud of that. Number four, uh, technician A says a cooling system should hold pressure for at least two minutes when its pressure is checked. Is that right? Um, hmm? You got any idea? Technician B says the pressure tester can also be used to check for combustion leaks. How would you do that? Watch the pressure go up and down. Yeah, if you put the, if you put the. Remember what I told you about this? If you and this is a, this is kind of like, almost like an engine repair thing, um, and I've had people, uh, you know, call me on the phone or whatever. They've been talking about overheating problems or something like that. And I said, take and crank the car when it's stone cold. It's been sitting there all night long. Fire it up, let it run for sixty seconds. One minute. Watch the watch. When it's been running one minute, you know, shut the car down. And you're going to take the radiator cap off. And you're going to see if it goes. If it does, there's some combustion getting in the water. And you got a blown head gasket. Shouldn't do that that quick. If the cooling system's healthy, there shouldn't be any pressure on it when it runs for, for a minute. How long should it be before there's pressure on it, more or less? When it starts to heat the water up, it's going to start expanding the water to make some pressure. But, you know, pressure by itself is not. But, hit this. If you put a pressure gauge on it, and you see pressure coming up, you can see you'll be able to tell with your leak, you know, whenever you put your compression tester on there, or your, I mean your uh, radiator system pressure tester, and you're going to pump it up. If it's one of the pump-up kind, we use our air pressure on ours. What if you just put it on there and don't do anything, crank it up, you can watch your gauge, see? So you know if it comes up too fast. Once again, if you watch cars that are healthy, you know what it's supposed to do. Got it? So number four is a C. Then number five is a true fault seat. Um, all right. Uh, let's see. A thermostat that is stuck open causes the engine to overheat. Yeah. yeah. It actually, no. I mean, it's, typically you're going to see the rule of thumb is if the thermostat's stuck open, if it's busted and it's just letting coolant flow all the time, or if it's been removed, the engine's going to be too cold. Um, on the old cars that had real thin radiators, if the coolant was going through them too fast, it might overheat. But that is so rare. I mean, uh, there, you know, like I told you the story before that I've, been, I've run into people that thought they had unlocked the mysteries of the universe because they would say, if you take a thermostat out of a car, it'll overheat. Well, that's not true in just about every case that I've ever seen. I don't know if I've ever seen one overheat when you take a thermostat out. I've known of it, but I've never seen one do that. You get me? It'd be kind of stupid if you thought that. Cause, I mean, it's always flowing water through yeah, I know. Unless the radiator is so thin that the water is not staying in there long enough to pick up to dump heat. You see what I'm saying? And occasionally, you may run into that. So what you you cannot categorically say if somebody says I took my thermostat out and the engine overheated. You can't say well it didn't happen because there's too many variables there. Right. But in I'm gonna say out of 500 cars, if you took a thermostat out of 500 cars, 498 of them would run cold. And you might run into two that may run hot, but it don't hardly ever happen. Um, technician A says a leaky heater core may show up as a drip on the carpet that's true technician B says you can test a heater core for leaks using a pressure tester yeah. 
Chelsea, did we ever do anything similar to that? No. Well, yeah. Uh-huh. You just about forgot that, didn't you? Yeah. We, we put air pressure on that oil cooler, yeah. and we sprayed uh, some... Uh, uh, now, we can't put that much pressure. Listen, you can't put that much pressure on a heater core, you'll bust it. That oil cooler is made to handle high pressure. But the, uh, but the, the heater core, you know, you're, it's only made to handle like maybe 16, 17 pounds of pressure. You know, make sure... And also, if you're pinching the air conditioner hose, I mean the heater hose, to see if you're going to make it, the AC cool off inside the car, don't pinch the one that's coming out of the heater core, or you'll bust the damn heater core sometime. All right. Okay. But uh, now you guys remember the story I told you about the Dodge van, or I mean the, the uh, yeah the Dodge truck that was wet in the passenger side floor when they ran the air conditioner. Yeah. Remember that story. Don't forget that. Sooner or later, you're going to run into it, okay? What did you have to do to fix it? No. Uh, I remember what you had to do, but it wouldn't be there. I had to put silicone around the evaporator ring because yeah. it was running back, going down behind the carpet. And that there's actually a bulletin on that. Technician A says fan clutch operation. Wait a minute. Yeah, let's see. Number six is, is actually going to be seat. Technician A says fan clutch operation can be tested using a strobe light. Can you test fan clutch operation with a strobe light? I don't think so. Huh? I don't think so. What is a fan clutch? <clears throat> the fan moves on? Or moves the fan a certain way? Hmm. <clears throat> Let me see if I can find one. Of them. I may not be able to find one. Hmm. The one I was looking for has been moved in some of our zealous cleaning up. Ah, oh, here it is. Now look. This is a fan clutch. Now, I want you to why would you need to test this? Good question. Because if the clutch goes bad, it could, it could uh, make the radiator start over or get too hot, can it? <clears throat> yeah, now, I mean, tell me how it worked. Can anybody give me an idea how this works? So your fan, I mean, I'm sorry, this is connected to your uh, water pump, mm -hmm. right? Okay, and this right here has got the fan bolted to it. And so, to begin, how, why are we doing this to start with? Why don't we just go ahead and put the fan right on the water pump? And let it just spin along with the engine. Because then it wouldn't move. Huh? It would be spinning all the time, yeah, but yeah. we used to do it that way. Controls how, I guess, how, how fast the was on what's the way We used to do it, yeah, it does, but. What is that finger? Huh? Talk to me, Wes. What is it? Why do we have a fan clutch like this on our radiator cooling fans? This is something you don't often think about. You've just seen it so often. There's one on the GMC. I mean, on the uh, you know, engine at 350. It's on the stand there. It's got one of these on it. All right. Have you ever seen one? Why do you do that? Why? I asked you first. Why? Yeah. That takes way more power. Ah, so let me ask you. If this sucker was locked up, it wouldn't turn at all. It would seriously take away horsepower, wouldn't it? You just got your answer there. But... This fan right here, you're wanting it to not use any horsepower hardly at all when it's not needed. So basically, the engine's just running and the fan's not moving very much. Right. The fan's not following the engine over RPM for RPM unless it needs to. If it needs to, it's going to do it. So how does it know when it needs to? Next question. How? When it gets too hot. And, and how does it measure that heat? There's a thermistor on the front of it. This is not really a thermistor. It's a bimetal strip. And if I was to take this bimetal strip, and this is pretty cool, uh, bimetal is two different kinds of metal that's married together. And whenever you uh, heat this thing up, one of them expands more than the other, and it changes shape. These choke springs, these spiral springs and chokes, when you heat those up, they actually change shape. And that's how your choke opens and closes. If I was to take this, and I can actually show you this, and heat this little strip right here on this one with a torch, you can see it change shape. And then when you let it cool off, it goes back down. Now, some of them have got a spiral spring, and they actually change the valve on the inside. And so when they do that, they got little, they got gel in here, this, this uh, silicone gel that's being 
cut through by all these fingers. Well, whenever you change the valving on this thing, it creates more resistance, and it starts going. Now, the, the newest ones, and I've got one of those around here somewhere, has actually got wires coming off of them going up here so that the PCM can determine how much fan speed you have. You got that? Now, you ought to be able to go in over your scan tool and select and change your fan speeds. I had one of those fans with the electric wires on it over there, over there on that uh, rack. But for some reason, my junk parts move around a lot, and I always have to hunt them. But anyway, this is on right here. So let me ask you again. I mean, uh, the question that we just asked was, uh, <coughs> Technician A says fan clutch operation can be tested using a strobe light. What if you put some tape, fluorescent, I mean, or reflective tape or any kind of tape you can see uh, on your fan and on your water pump plate, and you could see if they were matching their speeds with the engine running? That would take too much time. <laughs> when in doubt, put a $100 clutch on it. Okay. All right. <laughs> but the clutch is never locking in. And your engine, and it's a possibility that it might be causing the overheating thing. Now, we're not talking about re-engineering the vehicle. I mean, you might tell somebody, well, why don't we just take this junk and throw it away and put you an electric fan? Well, my Jeep has got an electric fan and one of these on it. So he's got both. You understand where I'm going with that? Uh, you can check it with a strobe light. That is a correct answer. Yeah. I'm not saying you need to rush out here and, you know, check all your fans with a strobe light right away. And that doesn't usually happen a whole lot, but it, you can check it with a strobe light. That's the question, right? Technician B says fan clutch should be locked up when the engine is cold. Well, that's not right. So number seven is going to be A. Two technicians are discussions, uh, discussing system flushing. All right. And let's see. Technician A says you should flush a system in the direction of normal coolant flow. Why not? Why? I want to go backwards so I can break all that stuff loose. Whenever coolant's been flowing through uh, these passages, all of the little crud is going to be pointing the way that the coolant flows. When you flush it backwards, it breaks that stuff loose and washes it out of there. Got that? Yep. All right, so he's not right, right? That's number eight. Okay. Technician B says a cooling uh, a system should be flushed until clean water flows out of the system. That's a B. You don't want to you know you don't you don't want to stop flushing that while there's still rusty crud coming out of it. Just point there. You know? All right. Now then. Incidentally, you guys have got a nice comprehensive. Uh, engine repair test tomorrow. And, I, and we probably ought to let you take a disclosed book and see what you know. I guess you saw that, huh? Technician A says if a core plug is leaking and it's diff in a difficult... You know what a core plug is? You'd call it a freeze plug, expansion plug. They call it a core plug. They're careful not to call it a freeze plug. That does not provide protection against your vehicle freezing. Now, sometimes it'll push one out, but that ain't what it's there for. You know, when they were making it, they had holes in the block there where the jig was yeah. holding it, and they put those core plugs in there to cut stop it up. But sometimes they rust through from the inside, and they start leaking. Matter of fact, I had the coolest picture of one, and when we pressured it up, it was had water shooting out like a water pistol, and I caught it with a camera and put it in there. All right, before Chelsea turns into a skeleton over there because she's so bored, i got to keep moving here. Uh, have you ever seen them Expandable rubber plugs? Yes. Are they, uh, what do they do? They get you by, but they're not a good way to do that. Yes. Technician B says rubber plugs should always be installed dry. Mm -hmm. Both those guys are right. If you put it in there wet, it may pop out of there. Two technicians are discussing radiator removal. Brandon, have you ever removed a radiator? Yeah. Well, if you didn't, you should have. That's all I have say. <laughs> you guys got to get caught up on your worksheets. All except Archie. He's got lots of live work to do. Hey there, I don't you? No, Except what? he's still going to have to do the same finals everybody else is doing, though. Yeah. And you've done a lot of your AC work. She's already in you. Yeah, I should. Yeah. All right, then. Well, you're going to do good. Mike yeah. just bought a uh, AC machine. Jason, Jason, 2788? Uh-huh. So, snap on. Whatever it is. Yep. You'll have a, it's it's going to be a 2788. You'll need it this summer. 
All right. You know how to use it? It's not hard, is it? All right. They're dumbing us down, making us, the, the machines does everything for us. All we got to do is plug it in and walk away. <laughs> I'm asking you. All right. Now then, it's probably got a little S, uh, SD card slot where you can up, update it and put new uh, stuff in there. I didn't yeah. look at it. We just turned it on the other day. All right. Did it make noise? Well, it should have. <laughs> All right. <No. laughs> Technician 8 says you should use two wrenches as you loosen the cooler lines to the automatic transmission. That's true. Brandon? What? You should never screw those coolant lines into the transmission when you can't see good. Or? I didn't do that. You did Pardon me? I'm talking about the cooler lines, and if you're, if you're working in the dark and you're trying to screw the cooler lines in and you cross-thread them and you destroy the, the radiator, line. huh? Yeah, I remember now. It's transmission oil line. In spite of all of that screw-up, he still got a $20 tip from the customer. It'd be all over the thing. I don't know how to do it. It was an old dude. Yeah, yeah I know. I remember. Yeah. yeah. Was that an old show? Yeah. yeah. Well, the, the reason he did it is because he's working in the dark. Down there trying to just fumble around and feel of that. And, oh, maybe I'll see how I Actually, nice Tyler it. put that one right here. I don't believe. Oh, yeah, I, I really do believe you. <laughs> <laughs> I put the one on the other side. Tyler put that one in, and I was like, "It was the bottom down there." I was like, "Yeah, it was like it's." He's like, "Oh, well, I, I, I didn't help you." No, we took care of it anyway. It's it's, it's fixed now. It's gone. I got it. Come back. All right. So, um, well, I mean, he will come back if he has another problem. But he didn't come back about that problem. Seemed like he's pretty happy about it. Now, let's see. Technician B says cooler lines on modern vehicles might require special tools. You know anything about that? Let's yeah. see. Both of them guys are right. When technician A says the major cause of engine overheating is a faulty thermostat that opens at a too high temperature. Technician B says the bleed notch or jiggle pin should be at the top when installing vertically mounted thermostats. Okay. You know what the jiggle pin is? Oh, in the thermostat? Yeah. yeah. Well, air, when you say it's the air. Yeah. What you'll see, Chelsea, is a... Uh, some of the thermostats, you know, the little thermostat, it's got a little hole. You know, there's the center part. It's got its little arch, you know, deal on it and all that. There'll be a little hole right there. And they'll either have a little ball in it or at least have a little pin jiggling around. And whenever you're putting air in the cooling system, if, you, if you've got a vertically mounted thermostat, if it's mounted like this, it don't matter. But if it's a vertically mounted thermostat, it lets the air out. While you're putting coolant in it, instead of trapping the air, so that you got to wait till the thermostat opens before it all comes out. Now, what I like to do, if I'm not sure about all this, is I like to put a heater hose, pull a heater hose, and pour coolant in the block and fill it up as far as I can. You know, there's all kinds of ways you can do that. But anyway, that's the jiggle pin or the whatever they're talking about. We'll I mean, make sure you're clear on clear on that. Um, let's see, number eleven B is the guy that's right on that. Typically, a, a thermostat. Um, but you don't usually see it. You know, when I was uh, when I was working at filling stations and stuff back in the seventies, we saw thermostats that were stuck closed all the time. But since and, and so we moved on into the eighties and nineties, I saw almost none of them stuck, causing them to overheat. But what they would do is they would uh, stick open, or they would you know break up and all that kind of stuff. All right, technician A says after service, it's a good practice to retighten the hose clamps. After the engine has been run and then cooled down. Did you do that, Brandon? Mm -hmm. Did you do that on yours? Technician B says when coolant is replaced, the coolant level should be checked after the engine has been warmed up. Yep. Huh? Yep. Should the coolant level be checked after the engine is warmed up? Brent, uh, John, are you okay? Ah, uh, yeah, I just kind of woke up a little late and I had to uh, jerry rig this uh, door so it would shut. What we're going to see if. What we're, <laughs> what we're going to do is we're going to. Um, uh, we're going to do, uh, we're going to set up, get your wife to set up an alarm that uh, uses some bottle rockets so you'll think mortar rounds are coming in and that'll get you up, right? <laughs> He'll think he's back in Iraq, won't he? Okay. <laughs> All, right. All right. Let's see. Let me see. Uh, we need to we need to retighten the hose clamp after it's been running cool down. Technician B says, when the coolant's replaced, the coolant level should be checked after the engine's been warmed up. 
Sure. And that's obvious. You need to spend time. And I'm going to tell you something else. And I've told you this before. That cooling fan needs to come on and shut off and come on and shut off and come on and shut off two, three times. We used to do it four times at the dealership. If it comes on and stays on, now you have your air conditioner and your defrost turned off and all that so you're not confused. But put the everything heater on. off, if it, yeah, put the heater on. You get If you're getting hot air from your heater and the cooling fan outside is kicking on and off, then and you see good, you know, good coolant. You're okay. And make sure your surge bottle is full too, or you know, at the full mark, and all that. So check all of that stuff. And uh, right. two technicians are discussing antifreeze. Technician A says green antifreeze should be changed every year or two to keep a cooling system clean. Technician B says an overheating system can be kept from boiling by using straight antifreeze <laughs> for a coolant. Whoa. <laughs> new, 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 new. Hey. That's an A. Man, that's a good idea to change the grant. Now, when I, ch- I saw it, when I changed the gold antifreeze that was in my Ford pickup, and it had 100,000 miles, it was like a brand new antifreeze when it came out there. But, um, but now this orange stuff, this Dex Cool stuff, you know, the propylene glycol, which is the same stuff they put in our little fruity drinks and all that kind of stuff. Um, anyway, this stuff right here uh, actually gets really chalky looking and rusty looking and ugly looking and I don't it's supposed to be 100,000 mile antifreeze but uh, it just seems like it does worse on some vehicles than others but I'll tell you one other thing let me tell you something about cooling systems while I'm thinking about it if you've got a cooling system that where air can just come and go anytime it wants to out of that system it's going to rust that thing like you wouldn't believe what kind of system has, has well like if you've got a bad radiator cap or anything it's just letting air come and go right. like uh, you know if, if it's Let's, let's say that you've got a situation where your surge bottle is completely empty. You ever seen that before? Mm-hmm. You're looking at your old surge bottle and you got a daggum thing in it. And the radiator's a little bit low. And you got a bad radiator cap, too, with that little, dang, that little piece dangling, that little vent valve dangling. Mm-hmm. And so anytime the coolant goes up and down in there, because it warms up and cools down, uh, is pulling air in. And it's pushing the air out. It's pulling the air in. It's pushing the air out. What are you going to get when you get air? Oxygen. What are you going to get when you get oxygen? Oxidation. What is oxidation? And rust. rust. All right. Now, how many of you know that you can measure the voltage in your coolant? Mm-hmm. How much should it not be? If I take my voltmeter and I hook it to ground and I stick to one of the probes in coolant and I'm reading four volts, i got some issues. My coolant has become acid and it's turned into an electrolyte. <laughs> And it's actually creating electrolysis, and it is dissolving the engine block while you sleep. It's not a good thing. Oh, wow. And some people would take it. That's scary, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. But uh, whatever you take it. Some people have, you know what an anode is? How many of you guys have ever been around the water, saltwater boats, aluminum saltwater boats? You know what anodes are? Not really. I know you've probably seen them, you know. You ever notice that Archie kind of sounds like he's asleep all the time? Oh, what do we do this? But anyway, they're going to have, you're going to see on the back of these boats, you're going to see these funky things that almost look like a big old tire weight or something. But it's it's insulated from the boat body, and it'll look sort of like this, and it'll have a, it'll be bolted like this, and it looks like it's dissolving away. It's a rough-looking, chalky uh, lead thing. And what it does is, this right here neutralizes the electrolysis that's trying to attack the aluminum boat. And so they have a radiator cap. If you've got a problem with electrolysis in your cooling system, they make radiator caps you can buy. You, know, you can get look them up on the internet. Radiator cap with anode. All you got to do is look it up. And you'll, they'll, you'll got radiator caps that have a little anode on the underside of the radiator cap. So when you put that radiator cap on there, you got that little anode that dissolves away that keeps your cooling system from dissolving the engine block. So, uh, how do you stop that? Besides that anode? Well, I always do a, a serious heavy-duty cooling system flush, and put you know you got to really flush it good and everything, and put something in there to break all as much that up as you can uh, to get away with it. That's CRS stuff. Will it hurt aluminum block? Yes, I, it won't if you just briefly flush it with it. Now, if you just pour it in there, or leave it in there for ten thousand miles, you may have some issues. You know what I'm saying? But I mean it's. You can't. I mean, I wouldn't put it in there and just leave, just leave it in there permanently. You know? But yeah, you can. We flushed them. I mean, and it washes that stuff out like you wouldn't believe. Uh, my buddy Donnie over there, he uses it all the time. He loves to put that stuff in a rusty engine block and cool it out. I mean, 
But um, something else you got to recognize too is them dead gum expansion plugs. Here's the thing right here. Uh, one day, it's, now comes story time. One day, there was a, a Ford pickup truck. It was an older one, a 97 model. And it was uh, right after a cold snap. It was in January of one year. Might have been January of, uh, was a year ago. And this darn thing rained in water. Right after, right after the cold snap, it rained water underneath the vehicle. I'm talking about when he cranked it up, it's just raining water everywhere. And if, you know, and so he goes to a shop with it. He's in the other, on the other campus, and usually we do the work on his truck, but he figures, well, let's get this took care of over here. So he goes to a shop, and they says, we're going to have to replace all the freeze plugs, and it's going to be $1,000. And he says, my goodness, this truck's got lots of miles on it. The whole truck probably ain't worth $1,000. And so he uh, he said, I'm going to haul this thing over there, and I'm going to let you all have a look at it. He's the same guy that owns this Explorer. All right, so he brings it over here, and we find one freeze plug leaking in the front of the right-hand cylinder. We found one leaking, which may have been the one they saw, and they just assumed because there's water raining from everywhere else that all of them were leaking because of the cold snap. And see, he didn't have, he didn't have any antifreeze in it. So we put that one freeze plug in there, and then we pressure tested it, and lo and behold, the intake manifold gasket was leaking. And it was running down the inside of the heads. It was dripping off the back of the motor, and it was raining all over the place. So we put intake gasket on it. That was great, right? Well, the story's not over. We crank it up. It ran. It was holding water good, and but it was trying to overheat a little bit. And so we, you know, was thinking, well, this radiator's been in here a long time. And so um, if you look down in there, and you could see rusty flakes of rust that was caught in the radiator flues. And so we put him a radiator on there. And we, put, we pried the end off the radiator, so we, oh, man, every flue on it was stopped up with rust flakes. It was horrible. So we put a radiator in there. Hey, this is great, but where did these big flakes of rust come from? Well, it's running cool right now, unless... We tried to drive away on it. And before we even got down there, you know, like we leave the building and we head down there like we're going to pull out on Ellis Road. Yeah, but what happened was it get hot. It would get hot for you in 100 yards. But it would sit here and idle all day long and run cool in the service bay. That is weird. It don't make any sense. It totally defies everything everybody knows about cooling systems. Pull the water pump off and the impeller had come off the water pump. So it was just laying in there. And that's where the flakes of rust came from, too. So water pump impellers can rust away. Cavitation can happen behind the water pump impeller and make it run hot, you know, because it's got to be closed up. Anyway, we put a water pump on it, and his overheating problem was over. Now, the reason he never really had a lot of trouble with that is because he was so close to work. He didn't drive hardly a mile and a half. And by the time he cranked it up and drove it to work, it hadn't really got hot enough to hurt nothing. He cranked it up and drove back, and he got hot enough to hurt nothing all the way home either because he just went twice a day. See, so driving habits, you know, die hard, I guess. All right, let me go over here. Uh, where are we at here? Uh, Technician A says the fan used with modern rear-wheel drive vehicle always rotates in a clockwise direction. Oh, ho, ho, ho! In what circumstances would it not rotate in a clockwise direction? Come on. Don't play dumb with me. You guys ought to know that. We've talked this before. One that op- operates the opposite way. All right, if I'm looking at the motor, if I'm standing in front of the motor, which way does the motor turn? The motor turns clockwise when you're looking at it. Now, why would the fan turn the opposite direction? To push or pull air? Hmm? To push or pull air? No. You can make the blades go either way, Dodo. But what you... <laughs> I mean, you can make it either way you want to. If the back of that serpentine belt is pulling that fan, it's going to be turning oh, okay. the opposite direction of the engine. If, this, if the serpentine... If that water pump belt is smooth... If the water pump pulley, I'm sorry, is a smooth and the back of the belt pulls it, it's going to be turning backwards to the rest of the engine. If it's grooved, it's going to be turning the same direction. Does that make sense? Are you lost? No. Huh? No. You understand what I'm talking about? Yeah. All right. Making good sense, huh? All right. (laughs) Okay. Now then. So technician A is a yo-yo. He does not know what he's talking about. Right now, let's see. Technician B says the fan clutch used on front-wheel drive vehicles can cause fan rotation in either direction. Oh, boy, is he ever wrong about that. Okay. His, oh, my fan clutch went bad, and it's causing my fan to run backwards 
Eight. Not right. Mm-hmm. Yep. Technician A says the thermostat test begins with the engine cold. Technician B says a good thermostat allows coolant to circulate immediately. He's not true, is he? I'd say only clutch fans are tested using a what? What do you use to test a clutch fan? A timing light. How can you test? Good grief. How can you test this with an ohmmeter? Come on. Do you see any wires or any circuits here? Now, some of them like got wires coming off of them. Brendan, you did have to trip my triggers. That's what you did. Ohmmeter. Okay. Do better than that. He played dumb with me. All right. He got least Yeah, that's what it was. Okay. This is important. Believe it or not, this is the last... No, he does that all the time. He only does that when he's getting on with another girl. That's what he is. Okay. But, uh, <laughs> but and, uh, anyway, what I was going to say was, this is the last written test you're going to have on air conditioning except for your final. Got it? Uh, yeah, I'm going to be probably... And when is our final? Huh? When is final? Mm, I hadn't decided yet, but we're going to try to get you started on pretty quick. Okay, technician A says the use of coolant recycling station reduces the need for system bleeding. Technician B says the use of a coolant recycling station reduces the need for hazardous waste disposal. C. That's a C. Both of them? The coolant recycling station will usually push the coolant on in there, you know, so that it doesn't have air. But I'm always going to check it and make sure that it's full anyway. Which of these is the most recommended mixture of antifreeze and water? But some of them use 7030. So never assume anything, okay? Some of the newer ones use 70, 30, and you know antifreeze is all different colors. Some of that European antifreeze will be pink and purple, and this case yellow and you know, blue, and that's all kinds of crazy stuff. This radiator cap was just, was co- discovered during routine service. Technician A says the cooling system should be flushed and refilled with the specified coolant. Technician B says the cap should be replaced. Well, both of those guys are right. A pressure gauge is installed on the radiator filler neck and the system pressurized to 15 PSI. After a few minutes, the pressure was down to 5 PSI according to the gauge on the tester. What is the least likely cause? That's stupid. How can you possibly... A leak in the evaporator? <laughs> yeah. yeah. B, leak in the evaporator. Which of these can cause a belt to wear or fail prematurely? Seized electric cooling fan? <clears throat> Loose engine mounts, pulley misalignment, pulley misalignment, or excessive cooling fan pressure. What? C. Excessive cooling fan pressure. C. Well, I mean, what's you? Yeah, C is the most common cause of it. Pulley mis- misalignment. Uh, oh, and here's another thing too. If you've got your, you know how we've done the power steering, where you pull the power steering pulley off and push it back on. If you put that back on and you don't put it back on all the way, you're going to have some belt alignment, squeaking, all kinds of crazy, all that stuff. So you got to be like, darn sure you put that power steering pump pulley back on there to the right spot. Because if, it, if it's out of line a little bit. Now you remember seeing the other day, Chelsea, I actually put that thing on uh, now who's that? No, you started on the coolant uh, I mean that uh, belt tensioner that was crooked. Remember that? And that was because of a sorry second-rate off-brand belt tensioner, and it, it lasted less than a year before it got out of line and started causing a belt to squeak. Okay, we're almost done here. What? Okay, that one. that's it. Another 30 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> <Kidding. laughs> oh. Coach Morgan made us do 60 leg lifts or something one time because somebody laughed. Hey. Good grief. Yeah, when I was in junior high school, you know, of course, we were all tough and washboarded anyway in those days, you know, so we ain't like the high school kids today. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right, I made basic training, punished the whole group because one guy did something. All right. Okay, now then, I mean, boy, I tell you what, I thought I had basic training when I had Thad Morgan for PE, you know. Um, all right. After a few minutes, the pressure was down. What's the least likely cause we got on there? Okay, oh, Temperature gauge approaches red part of the gauge on or 260 degrees or 127 degrees Celsius if driven at slow speeds, but does not overheat if driven at highway speeds. Well, cool. well are you sure? Not sure. But what about an operative coolant fan? Oh, yeah, it overheats cool. in town, but not on the road. That's kind of like my S4. It ain't got one. There you go. Antifreeze concentration should be at, well, see, that's okay if you're the mechanic and you know what's going on, but 
You know, somebody that's just wanting to drive without paying attention to anything, they're going to get in trouble. Anyway. Antifreeze concentration should be at least what, but no more than what? Hmm, that's an interesting question. That's C. 40 to 60? Yeah. Should it be at least 40%, but no more than 67%. And finally, which of these two worn belt is a neoprene belt? Okay. I say A. A. <clears throat> it's an A. When replacing a stretch type belt, hmm, what's a stretch type belt? You ever heard of that? No, what you do, a stretch type belt, believe it or not, has no tensioner. You take a strap to take it off, and you run a strap up under it. Like a, like a little, you can take a piece that you made for yourself. Take a strap and let it, and turn the engine, bar the engine over until that strap is going up. I mean, a strap like his camera strap, or, or, or one of them little straps from a, you know, ratchet strap. All right, you just take a piece of that strap and you roll it up under the belt so that it's trapped between the belt and the pulley, and then you just grab it and pull it from the other side, it rolls the belt off. And then you got to have a special pulley, I mean, a special tool to roll it back on there. <laughs> but it's a rubbery, stretchy belt, and those are sort of, Rare, you don't hardly ever see them. But, um, I think it, I, I mean, it would almost seem to me like those would go the way of the uh, vehicle with no dipstick, you know, because you know, when Chevrolet went took their dipstick away for a while, then they brought they came back with the dipstick again, <laughs> huh? Dipstick on what? Like on their uh, little uh, 3T40, like your little uh, 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 impalas and stuff, and whatever they have their little 3T40, and you got a, got a red cap on it, and you got to pull that pipe plug on the bottom to. For oh, the engine the running, yes, yeah, for the transmission I'm talking about, yeah, I'm sorry. Okay. So and then they came back, and the, the, the Impalas, the dipstick came back, you know. And, and so what happened to 25? Huh? 25 spots. No, that's actually true. Yeah, I'm about to say you can cut it off. It's a true. It's a true B. All right. Are you done?